I'll try that again. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Fantastic. Hopefully everyone is having a great day and enjoying the conference so far. So we want to welcome you to the, uh, the session on information security. And before we get started, help me understand uh, who's in the audience. So uh, let's see. How many of you uh, work in, particularly your focus in it is information security? Two, three, kind of, kind of. Okay. Uh, One more. Did you raise your hand? Okay, very good. Uh, how many of you manage, uh, this is a trick question. How many of you manage risk within your organization? A few more hands? Okay. All right. Um, how many of you sat through this presentation last year? to do today, uh, first of all, my name is uh, Greg Marrow, and I'm the, uh, the CIO for uh, Durham County Government. And as you know, uh, Durham is one of the, uh, the fastest uh, growing counties in the, in the state of North Carolina. Um, and we're going through a lot of, uh, a lot of growth, uh, particularly in our, in our downtown area. I think if you turn to the left, to the west, to the east, to the north, and the south, you'll see, a, you'll see a crane in the air working on something, whether putting up, uh, you know, uh, new residential properties or putting up new office properties, but uh, we're, we're undergoing a lot of growth, uh, a lot of development, and obviously, uh, you know, with that growth comes a lot more IT sort of responsibilities and, you know, for the county, for the city, and so uh, this is sort of an appropriate topic. Uh, given what's going on, I'm sure, in many of your municipalities, you're probably witnessing a lot of the, the same kinds of things. And so hopefully, uh, looks like that's not working. I'm sure it's on you. I may have to say Penny behind the podium. So what I want to do today is uh, kind of talk about three three areas. We have uh, a couple of hours to go. Uh, 45 minutes, all right. It's a lot of stuff. We'll try and get through it. So, uh, what, I want to, what I want to cover today is uh, talk a little bit about today's environment, uh, some of the things that we're witnessing uh, today. And I wanted to uh, sort, of, sort of tailor the, the presentation this time around, uh, you know, what department heads uh, what our boards and others might be thinking about in terms of today's environment and what they may be thinking about what those of you who are managing risk or those of you who are working in IT or those of you who are working specifically within information security, what kinds of things might you be doing uh, within the organization to, to protect uh, your, your municipality. So I wanted to give you that perspective uh, from the top of the, uh, the organization and then talk about some survivability uh, methods. Okay, so before I get started, um, to get us kind of going, uh, I usually uh, do a little trivia. So does anybody recognize uh, any of the numbers on the chart? Does anything come to mind? So usually when I'm reading, I, I, may, I may jot down uh, you know, little facts and uh, and keep them for for presentations like this. So I did see a hand in the back. I, I know what 4 a.m. is. You know that's what 4 a.m. is. That, that's when things break. That's, when things break. <laughs> that's pretty accurate, too. So since you started with 4 a.m., anybody else want to take a guess at that one? That's when the most um, spam emails come out. Most spam emails. Uh, could, could be true. 4 a.m., though, has nothing to do with IT. See, I, you know, the, you bring an IT audience together, you put some numbers up, first thing we start thinking about is, okay, might be related to IT, might be related to security. So, 4 a.m. has nothing to do with, uh, with information technology. I guess you kind of know, a little bit. So, I'll tell you. So, when the first alarm clock was built, it would only ring at one time. They couldn't set it any other time. And the only time that it would ring, it's 4 a.m. 
They solve a bunch of those, didn't they? They solve a bunch of those. <laughs> That's how far we've come, right? Uh, anybody else want to take a guess at any of the other numbers? What about the 99,448? We'll start with that. That has to do with uh, the recent uh, ransomware virus that uh, some of you all may have been running around. Yes. Chasing uh, a week or so ago. Wanna cry. Yes. Yeah, that's a snapshot to date, uh, about average in terms of how much ransom has been paid. The, uh, I'm not going to go through them all because uh, we just don't have that much time, but uh, I'll tell you, let's see, the first one. So 375 to 547 billion annually. That's how much money we spend on cyber responding to cyber attacks. And that's a US number only. That's a lot of money. Then the second one says by 2022, the number of jobs in the cybersecurity space that will go unfilled because of a skills gap. And then the 132 to 380, that's the average salary today for those information security managers, executives working in the space. And of course, that number is going up and up and up as more uh, CISOs or CSOs uh, begin to report directly into uh, the top of the organization, whether it's the county manager, whether it's the city manager, whether it's the CEO of the organization. Uh, they're becoming, uh, or, you know, a seat at the table along with, you know, the CFO and, and the CMO and everyone else, right? Okay. So, let's talk about today's environment. So this is a snapshot. This is probably a, a, a year old uh, uh, chart, but it talks about the greatest vulnerabilities and the uh, top information security concerns. And so it's obviously, uh, it's about a year old, so obviously it's missing uh, one that has kind of creeped up over the last year, and I think I may have skipped over that one. Let me go back just for a second. Um, yeah, the second bullet from the bottom. So 3.8 million in 2015, and that second one should say 638 million in 2016, not 15. So we went from 3.8 million to 638 million. That's a big jump, right? You might want to take a guess at what that is. Something that happened about a week or so ago. So that's ransomware. Payments in ransomware? Or for ransomware? Yes. Isn't that amazing? The jump from one year to the next. So, uh, so that's probably the circle that's uh, missing from this chart. So external attackers, 65% in terms of greatest vulnerabilities in data security. Are these kinds of things that concern any of you in, in the audience? On one hand, uh, are any of you dealing with any of these kinds of things right now? Okay. Obviously, we have to talk about this one because this was hot. What? Maybe less than a week, week ago, and there's still some, you know, some pieces of this. Uh, every time you pick up the news or look at the security magazine, you know, they're still talking about this uh, wanna cry. Wanna cry a worm. Did any of you have Windows 7 machines? Any Windows 7 users in the audience? Got a few hands? I think the majority yes. of everybody in here has it. What? Say that again? I said I think everybody has except for a few probably. Except for a few. Yeah. Uh, did anybody, was anybody affected in the audience? So they remember this was a uh, you know, this was a worldwide attack, right? This, this did not just hit locally, this hit everywhere, for the most part. And it's still, uh, it's still uh, causing problems in, in uh, smaller countries uh, around the globe. So this, this was a major attack. You know, they're still trying to figure out, 
they got some hints, they got some clues where they think it, where they think it came from, but uh, haven't been confirmed yet. So this is the kind of stuff that uh, we have to deal with. So here's, here's the question I have for you. For those of you who work in information security, for those of you who work in IT, did you get any calls from your, uh, either the county manager office, city manager office, or, or any of your board members? Did anybody call you? So I see a couple of hands, a couple of hands. So I got, uh, I got several calls. And what do you think the, the, the question was? Are we vulnerable? Are we vulnerable? Exactly. Are we secure? All right. And so these are the kinds of these are the kinds of questions you get when this kind of stuff hit the uh, hit the newspaper, right? So even when I sit with our, uh, so we have an external audit group that comes in, and unfortunately, anything that's happening around the globe, they bring into the meeting. But the first question is, um, is this happening here? Or what are we doing about this here? All right. And so a lot of times we're having to, I'm having to respond to stuff that might be going on in the federal government at the local level. So many times I have to level set, uh, you know, because it's a much different environment between uh, local government and federal government. But the point I'm making is that when these kinds of things hit, you know, your phone might ring and, and you might start to get the, uh, the questions regarding what are we doing about these kinds of uh, vulnerabilities, right? And we know that ransomware is a pretty hot topic right now. And we know that if the price is right, ransomware wins. It wins out every time, if the price is right. And so um, if you look at uh, you know, the, uh, the market for ransomware, it, you know, cyber criminals are on track to make nearly $1 billion. And that was in 2016. And that number is going up and going up. Now you might ask the question, how are they able to do this? How are they, how are they able to, to still get away with organizations willing to pay money? And it's not just happening to organizations, right? If you look at consumers, so this study said that on average, consumers are willing to pay about 100 bucks. And so I did a little poll, uh, speaking to a to an organization a couple of weeks back, and and I asked the uh, the organization if they, if, I, if I were if I got your your cell phone, how much would you be willing to, uh, to pay me to get it back? And most people said about a hundred bucks, because when I asked the next question, well, do you have any pictures on your cell that you haven't backed up that you would really kind of not like you know not, not not like to lose? And there were several hands that went up and said, yep, I haven't backed up my cell. I have pictures on it. I have several several other pieces of uh, information that if uh, if you got a hold of it, I would probably be willing to pay. How many of you sitting in the audience? I know none of you. You know, being an IT organization, this doesn't affect any of you. So I'm not even going to ask that question here because that would be uh, that would be embarrassing, right? So uh, they asked a question regarding business executives, and you can see uh, from the slide, business executives are willing to pay upwards of uh, $40,000, and we know of some organizations that have paid more than that, particularly hospitals. And what's so valuable about uh, data within a hospital? <coughs> yes. Now we've had some, we've had some, you know, when you, when you pick up the, uh, you know, when you pick up the news, uh, security news, you see all these, uh, you know, all these stories about data breaches. And but we have, we've had some right here in our backyard this year, right? So I'm, I'm sure many of you are familiar with uh, uh, UNC Hospital being, uh, you know, having to uh, to do some. You know, they had a breach, uh, they used some personal data, and so these things are happening right in our backyard as quietly as it is kept. Uh, but this stuff is real. So. What happens if you want to pay? How many of you uh, right now, if, uh, if your organization, you know, had ransomware, would you have to pay or would you, would you go the other route? So, the thing to remember, right, so it doesn't necessarily mean that when I say your organization, it doesn't necessarily mean I'm talking about assets that you have control of. Now, I don't know about 
your organization, but I know that within my organization, uh, we're still discovering critical assets that may not necessarily be backed up. But if someone got a hold of those assets via ransomware, I guarantee you that that department would, would have to pay dollars. Do you have any departments like that? Now, many departments are going out because, because of software as a service and making purchases or making procurement decisions without even involving. I'm sure this doesn't happen to your organization. But, uh, but sometimes they go out and make uh, procurement decisions without even involving uh, the IT organization. Until the question comes up, well, how are you going to get the data? Then there has to be an interface between either their system and something in our data center. Right? So these are the kinds of, this is the kind of environment that uh, that we're living within uh, today. And with software as a service taking off as, as big as it is, it's going to create more and more uh, headaches uh, for us. So we need to have a strategy for how to deal with ransomware within our organization. For some of you, you probably, you know, you probably do your backups, you do your patches, so this is not a problem for you. Right? And uh, some of you may have, uh, you know, this is a, it's been a, it's been a very busy month, right? This also came out this month. And this is this is primarily for um, uh, agencies within, uh, you know, within the federal government. But uh, the executive walk, the executive order that President Trump put out. So President Trump put out an executive order. Uh, on cybersecurity, and basically he said was uh, you know the agencies within uh, you know the executive uh, department you know they have 90 days to produce a risk management plan. So here's the question: Your CEO of your municipality comes to you and say, within 90 days, I want you to produce and bring back to me a risk management plan. Now I can guarantee guarantee you that the auditors that I sit with, if they read this, guess what they're going to ask me for next, during our next meeting? <laughs> a risk management plan. Exactly. Because they, you know, they're reading the stuff and they, okay, let me, let me go back and see what we're doing at the county. So, but why are they asking for a risk management plan? So by a show of hands, how many of you have a risk management plan? I know more than three. <coughs> okay. All right, well, that's a good lead into the next slide, then, I guess. And that is uh, when we talk about cybersecurity, the question is are you protected? So, some of you give me some, some, some input on um, what steps you're taking today to protect yourself. So if we already asked the question, uh, uh, how many of you have a risk management plan, and how many saw maybe Three, four hands go up. Security awareness training. Security awareness training, excellent. And testing. Okay, those are those are those are all all important survivability things that we should be doing, right? Um, and all of those is a session in and of it of itself, right? You know, we, we can talk about awareness training for the next hour in terms of what's an effective cybersecurity awareness training program. Not a one-time, not a drive-by, uh, but what's an effective awareness program, okay? So let's get into board, talk a little bit about board or management uh, expectations. And, and here what I'm talking about is, what are the expectations of the, uh, the organizations that you support? When they think about cybersecurity, what are their expectations of you? So anybody want to tell me, uh, if you've met with you know, anyone on this topic, in terms of expectations, what is it that they they are holding you accountable for? Systems will be available. Systems will be available. <laughs> Anything else? Patch management, upgrades, all that stuff. Patch management, upgrades, exactly, yes. All, and, and, and if you put that in business speak, how would you put that in business speak? 
you know, a, a board member calls you up and say and says what? Our system's what? Vulnerable or not vulnerable. Right. <clears throat> vulnerable or not vulnerable, right? And we and we have to take the actions or the steps necessary to to ensure that that is the case, right? So there's this term in the industry called information assurance. And so really what, what department heads, what your board members, what the business organizations are looking for is something called information. They may not necessarily know it's information assurance, but what they're looking for is a guarantee that any of our information assets, that you can assure them that they are being what? Protected, right? And any... I don't, I don't care if the data center is burning down. Two minutes later, three minutes later, they, they're going to want to get on their computer and do what? Work. They're going to want to do work, right? Have you had that? Have you had any kind of instance of that? Right? So when we talk about information assurance, we're talking about all of these kinds of things. And a lot of times uh, we focus on one of those particular things, and that's called information security. But when we talk about information assurance, assuring that the information within your organization is available when needed, then we're talking about all of these kinds of things, right? From risk management all the way up through governance. So I had three or four hands that went up and I asked the question, how many of you had a risk management plan? What about a disaster recovery plan? That you that you proactively test annually. I see one, two, oh, three, about the same number of hands. This is about information assurance, right? So what happens if you lose your if what happens if you lose your systems? What happens to the information? Right? It's available on other systems. It's available on other systems. Is it active, active data, uh, active, active data center? So, awesome. All right. So, what steps are we taking to make sure that information is readily available to the business users of our organization? I can tell you that, at least I can, speaking for Durham County, I can tell you that if, if if our center goes down, that our social services director and our health director, they're not going to give a. They, they're going to say. Sorry, I got to continue doing business. Right? They don't, they don't, I can, I can say all day long, well, I'm working on it, I'm working on it, but if I have a disaster, uh, they don't care a whole lot about that unless it directly affects their business as well. So when we talk about elements of information, assuring that the information you're working with is available, we're talking about all of these things. What about information governance plan? How many of you have an information governance plan? What about a business continuity plan? No, we all should have a, a, a business continuity plan, even if it says that I, I will resume business in five days. Right? But at least we should have something that says we know how to continue doing business if something happens. And you know, I, I can't tell the person who's walking in for a uh, you know for an exam within our health department that you know, sorry, you know, you got to come back 30, day, 30 days from now. Right? I have to have some way of continuing to do business, some form of fashion, right? Okay. I'm, getting, I'm throwing out these examples because when we talk about information assurance, we're talking about information that drives business and government. Right? We're talking about those things that drive business and government. And so when we talk about information security, if I go back, so that one little block that talks about information security, what do you think that is? I need all of this other stuff. But I also need, to, I also need, as someone said in the back, someone said here, I also need to do pen testing, I need firewalls, right? All of that is my information security, right? I need to ensure integrity of the information, I need to ensure confidentiality of the information, etc. That's the information security part. But it, it can't stand alone, that's the point I'm making. Okay? 
So information drives business and government, and risk environment is complicated and ever-expanding. Well, what do we mean about the risk environment? So, <clears throat> someone give me an example of, a, of your risk environment. When we say that it is complicated and ever-expanding, what do we mean by that? Attack vectors? Say again? Attack vectors? Yeah, attack vectors, yes. Right? That's 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 expanding every day. Risk can come in any form. I mean, whether it's a natural disaster, whether it's that, targeted. Bingo. That's that's exactly right. Risk can come in any form. Right? Doesn't necessarily have to be again, I go back to when we talk about risk, first thing we think about is IT related risk, but it doesn't have to be IT related risk, right? When we're talking about information insurance. And that's the area that I want to spend a little bit more time because I think uh, that's a, I think that's a critical piece of information security. Okay. And when we talk about the evolution of uh, the information security function, many of us have uh, focused on the the bottom layer, security operations, right? So the things I heard things like patching, I heard things like pen testing. Um, you know, protecting the network perimeter, you know, focusing on in on the firewall area. But what about uh, if I move up now and I start to think about risk, what about ensuring compliance, creating information security policies? So how many of you have information security policies? Now, I should see more than three or four hands. So I see, a, I see a lot more than three or four hands. So you have information security policies, right? Now, how do you ensure compliance to the policy? It's one thing to have the policy, but then how do you ensure compliance to the policy? Audits. Audits. So give me an example of uh, give me an example of that. Um, baseline scanning, okay. uh, network scanning, uh, hiring third parties to try intrusion detection and all that stuff. Okay. Cool. Cool. Now, what's in your information security policy for for your employee population? Give me an example of something it says in the information security. Don't share passwords. Don't share passwords. Now, how do you ensure compliance to that? Impossible. Impossible, right? <laughs> so sometimes I walk around and, and, and you know, there's certain people in the county you pull out the desk for you know exactly. Which <laughs> You're gonna find that little yellow sticky right. note, right? Yeah. Or the Rolodex. That's right. Now I used to work in um, uh, higher ed, but you, I don't know if I can get away with this. I hadn't tried it yet in, uh, in government, but in higher ed we used to. We used to, uh, when we found those little yellow sticky notes, we used to lock them out for uh, a certain amount of time. <laughs> but even after that, it still didn't work. How do you lock out a city manager or a mayor? <laughs> <laughs> that's a good one. Well, that's why having a conversation around risk is important. It really is. Uh, having a conversation. Because they may not necessarily be able to, to have, they may not be, be able to resonate with the bottom layer. But if you can get them to have a true risk management kind of conversation, right, then now you're speaking sort of their language. And you're talking about the, you know, the pitfalls of sharing your password, right, with your admin assistants or multiple admin assistants uh, within the organization. So, the point we're trying to make here is that we want to get to where we're having a risk kind of conversation. We know that we have to do those security operations kinds of things, but when we're talking to the business, we want to have, we want to have a risk conversation. Okay? Now I'm going to give you some examples of what we mean by that. So enterprise risk management. So when we talk about enterprise risk management, we're not necessarily, or we're not only talking about operational risk. So when we talk about enterprise risk management, there's a lot of risk within the enterprise, right? Now, how much of this are, are you responsible for? Do you think uh, the IT organization is responsible for, for reputation risk? I would say they're responsible for all of it, at least partial, in yeah. any single area. That's all right. What about financial risk? Any of you run an ERP system? Financial data? So there's some financial risk associated with that, right? 
Okay? But we want to focus in on operation, operational risk. And when we talk about operational risk, we're basically talking about you know, those day-to-day -day, uh, business operations. And when we talk about those day-to-day -day business operations, we're talking about risks that can come about as a result of actions of people. And so, these four categories, actions of people, systems, and technology <coughs> failure, failed internal processes, and external events, these are, these are sort of areas that you can begin to think about risks within your operations. Okay. I'm going to give you a little, some examples here. So when we talk about security, security is really an operational risk management activity. When we talk about managing firewall rules, when we talk about you know, confirming identity and privileges, all of these kinds of things are operational risk management activities. You know, they're, they're just simply risk management activities. right? So what's the risk of someone uh, you know, who you let go within the organization, you don't remove them from your systems until six months later. Of course you don't have that problem, right? Um, but anyway, the aim of these security activities is ultimately to manage operational risks. Okay, so, so again, when we talk about information security, we're really talking about an operational risk kind of conversation. Uh, when we talk about IT operations, many of us work in IT operations, IT operations is an operational risk management activity. The work that you do on a day-to-day -day basis is all about managing operational risk. Right? So, and then as someone pointed out a few minutes ago, there are other operational risk management activities. It doesn't necessarily have to be IT related. But these other kinds of things can affect our business. Right? So what if there is an emergency within your city, within your, your town, in your county, where you have to vacate the premises for three days? Could you continue to do business? Another type of operational risk, right? So to give, so let's jump in with the, with the time we have left. Let's talk about some survivability methods. So there's a lot we can talk about when we talk about survivability. We've all, someone already mentioned uh, number four, improve end user awareness. And as I said before, we could spend a lot of time just talking about an end user awareness program, so that that program is not just a sort of a one-time event. Uh, you know, new employee part of new employee orientation, and that's the only time you do uh, security awareness. Uh, we have to have a security function. How many organizations have a security function here today? Have a standalone security function within your within your IT organization. One. So we're just getting we're just getting a, a, a many of the you know many of the organizations the management. You know, the boards, they're just really starting to kind of see the need as a result of what's going on in the environment to have this kind of function within the organization. Uh, to have security talent within the organization, people who understand information security, right? It's not just, and this is something that we had to do at Durham County. So when I asked for a security resource, the first question was, well, don't you have a what? A what? Don't you, well, it was backup. Yeah, they asked that, and they, but they, 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 they wanted to equate it to another role within the IT department. But when I, when I asked for a security person, he said, well, don't you have a network security person? And I said, yes. So they scratched their head and go, well, what else do you need if you have that? Right? So, so a lot of times you're going to get these kinds of questions because they're going to equate, as soon as you say security, they're going to equate security with something that you may already have within operations, who's only looking at maybe your firewall, maybe looking at network security, wireless security, access security, da 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 da, da right? But they're not looking at enterprise security across the enterprise. And so that's something that your organization, you may want to start thinking about because 
HIPAA is real. For those of you who, who have a health department, right? You know, HIPAA fines, or I just read an article two weeks ago, an organization got hit with a $2.5 million fine. Because they ignored, they made the classic mistake, right? They had an audit, but then they said, ah, they didn't respond to the audit. And so they got hit with a $2.5 million fine. These things are real, right? And this is what your enterprise security officer or your, security, your, your chief security officer uh, these are the kinds of things that that person would look at within your organization. So I could go through the list, just don't have to have the time, but I will spend a little bit a little bit more time on risk management because I think this is critical, the risk management piece. And so when we talk about risk management, we're talking about all these things. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on it. I know there's a session on, um, I believe there's a session talking about COVID-5 uh, because you want to identify a risk management framework something that you can align to or work with, right? And so I think there's a session tomorrow uh, on COVID-5. So you may want to sit through that and, and get a better feel for exactly how you could align your organization with COVID-5, okay? Here are four categories, or four classes of risk. So when you think about risk, you might want to think about, uh, you know, using this, and these are some tools. So, so now I'm going through some tools that you might want to consider using when you talk about risk within the organization. So one is thinking about actions of people, systems and technology, et cetera, et cetera. Now, most specifically, this is kind of hard to read, but you'll have these charts, but this begins to break down those four classes of risk into subclasses and gives you very detailed information in each subclass, okay? And this gives you a way to think about, as an example, actions of people. So you could have some, and the reason why this is, you know, this one is so important, actions of people, because three out of every four cyber-related incidents are caused by whom? End users. People. Right? Okay? So you might want to, you know, look at these subclasses, whether it's inadvertent, whether it's uh, deliberate, whether it's just inaction. Inaction meaning I didn't have the skills, I didn't have the knowledge to respond to the HIPAA audit. Hence, I got hit with a $2.5 million fine. So if I had done a risk assessment, I would have said, had an audit done, looking at this chart, I would have said inaction, I don't have skills, I don't have knowledge, I don't have guidance, and so that's a, that's a high risk for us as an organization. Right? Just a way for me to look at risk, a way for me to identify risk within the organization. I'm not going to spend a whole lot of time on this chart other than to say this is a, this is a chart I have used many times to have a business kind of conversation with department heads, with the county manager, with our general managers regarding risk within the organization. And I make the point that we have assets. We have four classes of assets. And you know, you always hear people are the greatest assets within an organization, right? That is true. But there are also other assets that if lost will cause a lot of headaches. And one is what? Information. And so when we talk about cybersecurity, a lot of times we're just focusing on the, what are the two that we're focused on in cybersecurity? Information and technology, right? But you also have people. And so these, these, these assets at the bottom of the chart, these assets drive business processes. And so sometimes when I'm seeking funding for a security piece of equipment or a security personnel, I have this level of conversation. I talk about a business process that will be affected if I cannot procure or if I cannot acquire a certain piece of asset, whether that asset is people, whether that asset is information related, and if I can't, then that business process will be affected. If the business process is affected, then that means that the service will be affected, right? And if I can't deliver the service, then my citizens will be impacted. And no one wants to hear 
that we will no longer be able to provide a service to citizens. Right? So it's just a way of having a conversation. Okay? Again, just a tool that I use. Here's another tool. Top, top risk facing the organization. Again, a very, a very, a very straightforward uh, matrix. All I'm doing is plotting. Once I identify what those risks are, I'm just simply plotting those risks in one of these four categories. Whether it's management critical, whether, whether it needs immediate action, whether it's no major concern, it's been identified, but it's no major concern. It's just a, it's just a matrix to plot what my top five risks are within the organization. Now, for those of you who don't have a risk management plan, this is a good place to start. But just asking a very simple question, and that is within my IT organization, I'm not even going to look outside. I'm just going to start with IT. What are the top five major risks within the organization? And one of those might be, I don't have, you might say, one of our major risks, I don't have a network security person. And if I have a network problem, I'm depending on a consultant, I'm depending on calling someone to help me resolve that problem. Hence, it may take a long time to resolve it, right? It's best for me to know the risk within my organization before I can go to finance, before I can go to uh, public health, before I can go to social services and talk to and start talking about, let's do one of these for you. Right? Because I, I better have my act together first before I go outside the organization. Okay. Again, very basic tool that I've used within uh, within the organization. I do a risk snapshot and mitigation plan. So this is just simply saying once I know the once I know the um, you know what those top five risks are, then the bottom box simply says what's my mitigation plan for those risks. Okay. Again, you'll have these charts. These are just tools, but very basic tools to use to identify what your risks are and what your mitigation plans are. Okay. And the, and the, uh, the chart on the right just says, for this particular risk, what's the frequency of that risk happening within your organization, if you have some way of tracking that. Okay. Here's another basic tool, controls benchmark, right? And then that bracket insert high level comment just means whatever, the, whatever for your organization, what, whatever comment you want to insert there, it's a good place to put it. And then you may want to, as an example, up, put down on the left hand side, you know what your what your risks are, and then benchmark that against um, uh, industry and best practice. So, as an example, information security policy. I asked the question: How many of you have an information security policy? <coughs> right. And so here you see I have graded uh, ours at a two, but best practice says should be up in the, between the four and five range. So again, you can think about some of these kinds of things. Somebody mentioned end-user security training, right? So we're sitting at about a three, but best practice again says you should be up around between four and five. How many of you do information security training, awareness <coughs> training? How many of you do it more than once a year? How many of you track it? Awesome. So you have a you have a way to ensure compliance to your training. Awesome. And that's what you want, right? You want to be able to, because the first question you get, first question I get from the auditors who come in and read something in the papers is, well, how often do you do that? And how do you ensure compliance, right? These are the kinds of questions that we get. I have a question. Yes. How did you give yourself a two? Is there a set of, set of uh, criteria that you go by? Yes. Okay. Yeah. And so, again, just measuring against uh, 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 metric, just measuring against a um, a metric that we've set for ourselves regarding uh, the number of uh, trainings that we do, are we, and the number of people that's taken the training, number of people passing the exam, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. This chart again hard to read, but risk triggers assessment. So again, this chart is just some questions for you to read, and, and it's just a basic yes or no. Give an example of one. Uh, let's pick a good one. I, I don't know. We don't have time. Is the IT asset internet facing or does it require third party access? So do you have an IT asset within your organization that requires third party, a third party access? And what's the risk associated with that? I'm sure you have thought about that and you have a risk management plan for that. 
I'm giving you all these questions. You'll have that in your, in your some, of the, some of the other questions. I don't know. Uh, will the IT asset be based on provision by not strategic vendors? So do you have some IT assets that are, you know, they access, but the vendor is not part of your, your strategic plan, right? Et cetera. So again, just some things to think about. Here's another very simple template, a risk identification template. So on this one, it just simply says, if you're working on a project, you might want to hand this template to the person and say, let's identify the risk associated with this project. How many of you worked on a project? No one has talked about risk. And lo and behold, at the end of the project, you get surprised by something. But these kinds of conversations should start at the beginning of, even before, you know, this is usually part of the, what they call the kickoff phase, right? Okay, now let's talk about project risk. Right. Okay. Uh, another hard to read, but you'll have this in your package. But these, this chart gives you some, again, a, a, an exhaustive list of things to consider. And one example is if we talk about, uh, I'm just going to pick number one, uh, availability risk, skills and resources. Insufficient or skill resources impacting IT services. Do you have that? Things to just read and then consider. Is this kind of these are these are questions you can read to do some introspection. Right? Think about with, with respect to your organization. This is about risk, managing risk. That's what information security is all about. Managing risk within the organization. Okay. So We've covered a lot. I want to leave just a minute or so, a little bit of time, for in case anyone has any other questions. So, well, you know, all of you know uh, um, uh, Nick Nitt. Uh, he spoke at a uh, conference uh, earlier this week, and this is what he said regarding uh, you know, coming back around, full circle now, back around to the want to cry uh, worm. Basically, he said, uh, you know, we should use this as a teachable moment, right? and that we should attack our own employees. So we want to, we want to attack our employees in a, in a safe environment, right? So how many of you do um, mock fishing exercises within the organization? So quite a few of you, right? That's good. And that's, that's exactly what he's, what he's suggesting. He's also saying, okay, give, give employees a heads up, right? You don't want to have any morale problems. Um, I can tell you the first one uh, we did, uh, we didn't give anybody a heads up, and lo and behold, Greg had all kinds of problems. <laughs> but uh, lesson learned. Um, but we had folks following Microsoft. We had, you know, we had people executing all of the plans that were in place, which was good. But uh, when they found out it was just a, a marked exercise, they were, they were not happy. <laughs> Yeah. So you want to do those kinds of things. And then he basically says, uh, you know, keep your third party. Uh, so we're back in that operations category now, right? Remember the evolution of IT? We're back in security operations phase, these kinds of things that he's recommending. You know, keep your uh, third party software up to date, apply patches as, as they are available. And this is something that uh, many organizations struggle to do, and that is apply patches. Sometimes we run third-party systems that are not ready to apply a patch because, you know, the folks who run, who have built that third-party system, they haven't caught up yet, right? And so we have that example with um, NC Fast. I don't know if any of you... <laughs> I won't go there. <laughs> I won't go there. So anyway, um, we're at the end. So why do operational risks matter? Um, basically, trust and confidence, right? We're talking about uh, the organization. You know, whether it's employees, whether it's uh, your department heads, we're talking about trust and uh, confidence. They want to make sure that information is available to them when they need it, uh, at any time. I don't care what happens within IT, I got to run my business, right? And so if we have a problem within IT, you know, they, they expect to continue to do business. They don't expect to turn, turn away folks who are walking in the door. You know, public health and social services. They, they, they expect to continue to do business. And so we have to, we have to keep that in mind. And then we know that, uh, you know, I'm not going to go through all of this, but uh, you know, these things also drive uh, life, safety, and health of customers and employees, what we're talking about today. By knowing 
the operational risk within the organization. Very important. And so, I hope that we've covered something. Um, as I said before, you know, boards and management personnel, they're concerned with protecting all information assets, not just, not just that little information security square, but all of those things, right? All of those things play a role in protecting information assets. Your disaster recovery plan, your business continuity plan, et cetera, et cetera, right? Not just, I know we want, sometimes we want to focus in on information security, things like measure <coughs> firewalls, pen testing, da -da. nope, didn't come to talk about that today. So I wanted to give you the big picture of what goes into managing information assets uh, within an organization. And robust risk management, critical part of, inf of any information security program, having robust risk management in place. So I go back to the President's executive order. If we were given 90 days to produce a risk management plan, could we do that? So you'll have all of this information. Uh, again, these are just templates, tools, you know, that I use to help me navigate through, you know, whether it's conversations with our external auditors, whether it's conversations with our, uh, our county manager, whether it's conversations with our department heads. These are just a, a combination of uh, these kinds of tools to have a uh, to have a business level uh, conversation. Okay. Questions, comments, thoughts. There's gotta be some something out there. Okay, do we have access to the slides? Yes, the you'll slides. have uh, you'll have access to the full deck. Okay. It'll be on the uh, Nickel Jesus website after the conference. Thank you. Thank you. The Nickel Jesus website. So, Greg, yes. um, would it be a risk problem if you shared your risk management plan that you have in place? <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to give some thought to that. Yeah. I would be interested to see if you had a sample of one that you used when you were building yours, that would be fine. Okay. I may have a sample that I can, okay. because our risks are in, right? So I, I would be kind of uh, leery yeah, to... I understand that. Yeah. I, 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 I would like a sample of something, so okay. something that's viable. That's a great question. Thank you. I'll, I'll see if I can uh, pull something together. And if so, um, either give me your card or... Uh, we'll put it up on the site. Or we'll put it up on the site. Okay, Yeah, absolutely. Right. Yes. Happy to share any and, any, and, any and all that may help our colleagues. Anything else? Well, thank you all for your, uh, your participation today. I Thanks hope this was helpful.